Hebrews chapter 13. Our passage this morning is going to come from verses 20 and 21 of Hebrews chapter 13. It says this, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. If you were to observe our worship services, maybe even this month, from the position of an outsider, you might come to the conclusion that Christianity is weird. Just plain weird. This month, we have spent a considerable amount of time singing to God about the birth of a baby named Jesus on the other side of the world roughly 2,000 years ago. We read from a book that we insist is no ordinary book, but the very Word of God. And we commit to ordering our lives by what is written there. Not just when we gather on Sundays, but every day and in every area of our lives, we are saying that our desire is to live in accordance with this book. A couple of weeks ago, we dunked some people underwater as a sign of their faith in Jesus. At the end of our time together today, some of us are going to drink some juice and eat some bread, which we say represents the body and blood of Jesus, and I say represents Dimetap and Styrofoam. Can I get an amen? If you're a Christian, or maybe if you're a child growing up in the church, these things don't seem weird to you. That's just simply what we do when we gather. We pray, we sing, we read the Bible, we listen to it being taught, occasionally people are baptized, occasionally we observe the Lord's Supper. This is, these are just the rhythms of life within the body of Christ. But if what we're doing has no truth and no power behind it, then we'd have to conclude that the Christian life is not only pitiable, but maybe even harmful or dangerous. Because the Christian life is not simply a matter of liturgies or ceremonies that we perform on a weekly basis in the relative privacy of a building like this. It is a life completely reoriented around the claim that the baby that we've been singing about this month was no mere man, but the very Son of God. And it's a life completely overturned by faith that this Jesus is the only way, the only way, anyone can be reconciled to the God who made them and to be spared His just judgment. For some people who embrace this gospel, it means they have to forsake the beliefs and traditions of their families. Some will have to embrace hostility and persecution even to the point of imprisonment or death. All of us embrace a worldview of the Bible which determines what is right and what is wrong if we are to follow this Jesus. It leads us to tell other people that they, st say they stand condemned before God and they face an eternity in hell outside of faith in this Jesus and that to be saved they must turn from their sins and repent in Him. And all of this hinges not only on what happened at the birth of Jesus, the fact that He came, but on the life that He lived, the death that He died, and what happened three days later in a garden tomb outside the city of Jerusalem. The sermon series that we're wrapping up today that we plan to revisit each year around this time is about understanding the reasons why Jesus came. In the last three weeks, we've seen that Jesus came to absorb God's wrath for our sins by dying for them, to obey God's will as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, to take the guilt of our sin away, and then last week we saw that he came to learn obedience by actually living out a righteous life so that he can sympathize with us as our Savior. And that's all well and good, assuming it's true. But what is the basis of our hope that these things are true? 
Why is it that we do what we do, believe what we believe, practice what we practice, and preach what we preach? Is there truth in it? Is God's power behind it? How do we know? The text before us today is the benediction of the book of Hebrews. We have a new sermon series starting in Hebrews next week, but we couldn't wait to get into Hebrews. So the last two weeks, we've got a message from the middle of Hebrews. I'm preaching the end, so spoiler alert, you're getting the end before the beginning. But we won't be in Hebrews 13 again for like another 10 years, so <laughs> you, you will have forgotten this. And that is all right. Because we have the sermon series in Hebrew starting next week, I'll leave it for Michael to do much of the contextual work as, for the book as a whole. Um, for our purposes today, it may be helpful for you to know that the ultimately unknown author of Hebrews, someone with perhaps under apostolic authority, was writing apparently to a group of Jewish Christians and they were tempted, it seems, to retreat away from the gospel, away from Christianity, and back into Judaism, back into law-keeping, in order to avoid persecution and hardship for the sake of following Jesus. Just after the passage that we're reading today, as the book concludes, the author in 1322 calls this a word of exhortation. Some people see the book of Hebrews really more like a sermon than a book. Or a letter. So you can't actually preach a whole book in one sermon, Michael. The underlying argument of Hebrews is that what God has done for his people in and through Jesus is far superior to all the forms and practices of the old covenant, and therefore there is no going back. Jesus is the only way for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. Now, if you want to sum up the, the message of Hebrews 13, 20, and 21, at its, at its core, Hebrews 13, 20, and 21 is a prayer for the people of God to be equipped by the power of God to do the will of God for the glory of God. And at the heart of this prayer, oddly enough, is the first and only explicit mention of the resurrection of Jesus in the entire book. Elsewhere it is implied, but this is the only place in Hebrews you will find a specific reference to the resurrection of Christ. My goal for us today is that we would see that the resurrection of Jesus is not only essential to everything that we've been saying so far, to being spared from God's wrath, to having our guilt removed, to having confidence that Jesus is our sympathetic high priest, but that the resurrection of Jesus is also the foundation upon which lives of joyful obedience to God for His glory are built now. As we move through the text, I want you to see the structure of the prayer, and then we'll draw three implications from the resurrection of Jesus. The passage is short. Let's read it again. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The prayer is in four parts. First, there is the invocation or an appeal to God. Second, the basis of that appeal is a description of God. The third part is the specific request or petition made to God. And the fourth part, fourth part is a doxology, or a description of glory to God. Invocation, description, appeal, doxology are the four parts of this prayer. First, you'll notice in verse 20, God is called upon as the God of peace. This means He is the source of peace. He is the bringer of peace. Practically speaking, this means if you don't have peace with God, you can't make it with Him on your own. If you have peace with God, it is because and only because He has made peace with you through Jesus. But that also means that He is the source and bringer of peace between people and within a person. So true and lasting peace, even eternal peace, finds its source not in human effort or achievement, but in God the God of peace. And notice how costly this peace is. You'll see Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in Him, that is Jesus, 
all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So peace with God is made through the death of Christ for sins. It's a fairly common saying, I think, as, as people near death or as we reflect on loved ones perhaps who have died, to say something like, well, I've made my peace with God, or he made peace with God in the end. But nobody ever actually made peace with God. We stood under the righteous wrath of God for sin. Michael preached that a few weeks ago. And the propitiation, the removal of that wrath, came not through our effort, but through the blood of Christ. But notice how peace from God among His people also comes the same way. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So the God of peace makes peace with sinners and among sinners through the death of Christ. Next, God is described as the one who brought the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, from the dead by means of his blood. We're going to deal first with the description of Jesus here and then the heart of the prayer, and we will come back to the implications of what it means that God brought him again from the dead. Jesus is described here first as the Lord, which is basically the oldest Christian confession. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. Which means Jesus, and not me, and not you, not the government, not anyone or anything else then, is Lord, Master, and Ruler. The great and most basic Christian confession is Jesus is Lord. This Lord Jesus is, we see, the great shepherd of the sheep. Now, Hebrews is full of references to people and elements of Old Testament history and worship, and the author systematically shows us Jesus' superiority to all of them. And this is another one of those examples, which is a, sort of a revisiting of a place that he's already been. The reference to the great shepherd of the sheep is to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah 63, 11, which refers there to Moses as the original great shepherd of the sheep. He was the great shepherd of the sheep who brought God's people up out of the Red Sea through the wilderness, leading them towards the Promised Land. So the reference to the great shepherd of the sheep here is supposed to be reminding us of God's deliverance of the Israelites through Moses in the Exodus. The author of Hebrews has actually already spent some time talking about Moses back in chapter 3. Jesus' support, superiority to Moses is explained there in terms of Moses being a servant, but Jesus being the Son. Moses can get you to the borders of the Promised Land. Joshua can take you in. He can bring you into the rest or to the peace that's to be found there. But the point of Jesus being the great shepherd of the sheep is a reminder that we need Jesus to shepherd us to true and lasting peace. As he said of himself in John 10, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He has authority to lay it down, and as we'll see in a moment, he has authority to take it back up again. I hope you didn't miss this in one of our songs this morning. One of my favorite new hymns that we sing is Christ the True and Better. This is the third verse that we just sang. Christ, the true and better Moses, called to lead a people home, standing bold to earthly powers, God's great glory to be known. With his arms stretched wide to heaven, see the waters part in two. See the veil is torn forever. Cleansed with blood, we pass now through. Hebrews is an excellent book in helping us see how all the things that are mere shadows in the Old Testament find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Here, Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, is the true and better Moses. Which means that God is leading and caring for His people, His sheep, by means of Jesus. 
which is even more significant when you consider other Old Testament imagery drawing on the shepherd. It's frequently used of leaders of God's people, like we saw with Moses just now, as we've considered many times with David throughout our series in Samuel and also in the Psalms. But I want you to see a couple places in Ezekiel chapter 34 where the shepherd imagery takes a little bit of a turn. Ezekiel 34 Verses 15 and 23 is set in the context of the Lord rebuking sinful shepherds or sinful leaders of His people. And He's announcing His plans for what He's going to do. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. But just a few verses later, in verse 23, it seems like His plan has changed. He says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. So which is it? Has God decided to shepherd his people himself? Or is he going to send Jesus, the son of David, to shepherd his people? Michael has trained us well enough to know that the answer to that question is yes. Jesus, who is truly God, is the Father's appointed shepherd of His people. So now we move to the third part of this prayer. We've seen the invocation, the description, now the request. God is called upon to equip believers with everything good that they may do His will. It means it's a prayer that God would equip or perfect, your translation may say, His people for every good work in obedience to Him, acknowledging simultaneously that He is the one working in us through Jesus that which is pleasing to Him. And then again, it's all summed up in that fourth part, the doxology. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. We'll deal with that momentarily. For now, let's turn our attention back to the resurrection of Christ, the bringing again from the dead the Lord Jesus and see three implications of it for Him and for us, His people. Because we want to see from this passage what it has to do with why Jesus came. And I think we're going to see that He came to die, and He died to rise. The first implication, the resurrection of Jesus vindicates His sacrifice. The resurrection of Jesus vindicates His sacrifice. Look back again in your Bible at verse 20. My mom was an English major, and if I had written this sentence in a paper that I had her proofread, she probably would have written, run-on sentence. It's not for me to correct the grammar of the biblical author, but it is for us to try to understand it, because the structure of this sentence, especially in English and in many of the translations that you're using, may actually be a little misleading as to what is intended here. The ESV, the NASB, the King James, most of the modern English translations, at least to me, seem to indicate that the bringing again from the Lord, bringing again from the dead, the Lord Jesus, is for the purpose of equipping you with everything good that you may do His will. If you look at the way the clauses are ordered, it seems though that the NIV has it best. Listen to the NIV, verse twenty. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that that great shepherd of the sheep. Did you catch the difference there in where the clause through the blood of the eternal covenant is placed? It seems that the author's intent is to say to us, it was by means of his death that God brought him from death. It's fine to understand that, but it seems interpretively to make it a little more challenging because that's a very unusual thing to say. How are we supposed to understand what it means that God raised Jesus from the dead by means of his death? A lot has been written about this. I have found F.F. Bruce's comment on this to be most helpful. He says, Jesus was brought up from death by the blood of the eternal covenant. That is to say... His resurrection is the demonstration that His sacrifice of Himself has been accepted by God and the new covenant established on the basis of that sacrifice. 
The blood of the covenant is clearly a reference to Jesus' death. We're observing the Lord's Supper today. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11 and Matthew 26. In 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 26, it says, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Likewise, in Matthew 26, Jesus gives the disciples the cup to drink. He says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So when we observe the Lord's Supper, even in a few minutes, we are reminding ourselves of His sacrificial death. That is the blood of the covenant. So then it is His death on the cross, His blood of the covenant, that secures, or we might say achieves, His resurrection from the dead. That is, His resurrection is proof positive that God actually accepted His sacrifice as payment for sins. How can you know God's wrath for you is removed in Christ? How can you know the guilt of your sin is gone on account of Christ? What is your confidence that you can draw near to God through Jesus with a clean conscience and find mercy and grace to help you? Because God raised Him from the dead, never to die again. I've said this in children's ministry a lot, I give the kids this advice. Don't trust anyone to give you eternal life if they don't have it. I don't think that's bad life advice. If someone promises you eternal life and they don't have it, look somewhere else. All of the spiritual gurus and self-help seekers and worldly philosophers are headed to the grave and death is still batting a thousand keeping them there. And a Jesus who remained dead would be of no help to us. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 15. Faith is futile, sin remains, and we are misrepresenting God if Jesus was not raised. But since He has been raised, all of the things that He said and did have been vindicated. Which means you can trust Him for forgiveness. You can entrust yourself to Him eternally. The shepherd of the sheep whom God led forward out of death can be trusted to lead you and me out of death and into life as well. But I thought it was worth considering for a moment why we believe in the resurrection. So if we're saying to the outsider, the weird things that we do, the songs that we sing, the ordinances that we observe, it's because Jesus was raised from the dead. Well, why, why do we believe in the resurrection? Well, because the Bible tells us that he was raised from the dead. Okay, well, why do you believe the Bible? Well, because Jesus believed the Bible. He believed the Old Testament. His apostles wrote the New Testament. Therefore, since I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible because he was raised from the dead. Well, where did you get that information about the resurrection from the dead? The Bible. And so we may be of no help to the outsider by saying, I believe in the resurrection because the Bible says so, and I believe in the Bible because of the resurrection. Let's consider three things then, three evidences that Scripture's testimony of the resurrection is trustworthy. First, look at the historical Jesus and the empty tomb. The historical Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived and died under Pontius Pilate and who was buried in a tomb that was found empty on the third day is not debated among even unbelieving scholars. You have to account for a historical Jesus and an empty tomb. The empty tomb was acknowledged by Jesus' enemies. Their whole strategy for denying the resurrection was coming up with an explanation for why the tomb was empty. They came up with the story about his body having been stolen by apparently people who snuck past temple guards, rolled the stone away, and got his body out of there. They didn't deny it was empty. They affirmed it was empty, and their whole story hinged on an explanation for it being empty. Further, the biblical testimony is that it was women who discovered the empty tomb, which in that culture would not be the story that you would invent if you wanted your story to be believed. There were theories that he didn't die, that somehow he recovered in the tomb and got himself out of there. Theories that people went to the wrong tomb, which again doesn't hold up to the explanation that his body had been stolen from the correct tomb. His body was never produced. You have to account for the historical Jesus and the empty tomb, and the resurrection is what fits the evidence. Second, consider the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and the impact it had on his followers. The Bible itself is honest about the doubts, fears, and questions of the apostles. 
But notice what happens after they saw the risen Christ. They willingly went to their deaths for the testimony that he had been raised from the dead. Would you die for something you knew was a lie? And then there's Paul. Paul, who was openly persecuting Christians, seeing them arrested, giving approval even of the stoning of Stephen. And after seeing the risen Christ, he becomes the greatest Christian missionary and church planner in world history and is the human author of much of the New Testament. How else can you explain the radical transformations of hundreds and hundreds of people who saw him? Third, the emergence of Christianity itself is a testimony to the truthfulness of the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection is central to Christian belief. It did not emerge out of other cultural or religious influences. Even the Jews who believed in Jesus were not anticipating the bodily resurrection of a single man, but a resurrection at the end of history. The claim that Christianity invented the resurrection does not fit the evidence. The resurrection is the foundation of Christianity. That is the message of the first Christians. Jesus is alive. We have seen him. We have touched him. We have eaten with him. We have spoken with him. Jesus is alive. Now, to accept these things unto salvation is certainly a work of God's grace through faith. It is not for me with human wisdom to persuade you to believe in the resurrection if you do not. But if you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, my challenge to you is to examine the evidence. Give consideration to the biblical testimony and the historical record which support the resurrection of Christ. If the resurrection is true, there isn't anything more important in the world than believing in Him and being reconciled to God through Him. And if you are a Christian, then my encouragement is to make the resurrection of Jesus central to your evangelism. I grew up in Virginia. My best friend from elementary school through the end of high school was, and as far as I know still is, an avowed atheist. I became a Christian in college. And as a very, very young, immature believer, the Lord gave me the desire to share the gospel with my friend. We were living several states away. Um, we emailed on occasion. And so I thought I would, I would send him an email laying out that I had become a Christian and telling him about how Jesus had changed my life. And that is not an invalid way of sharing your faith with someone. Talking about what Jesus has done for you is an important part of your testimony. When we interview new members here, we want to hear about the impact that faith in Jesus is having on them in their lives. But the mistake I made, I think, was making my own experience the focal point of sharing the gospel with him. And it's not a surprise then that I got this reply. He said, Tom, I'm happy for you. That's great. I'm glad that works for you. But that doesn't work for me. And that doesn't work for a lot of people. See, I had made what Jesus had done for me the gospel, when the gospel is actually the news of what Jesus has done objectively in his death and resurrection. If he has been raised, then he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. And to him, you will give an account whether or not you think it works for you or not. Make the resurrection of Jesus central to your evangelism. Whatever means God has provided of vindicating His Son ought to be foundational in our testimony about Him to others. So the resurrection of Jesus vindicates His sacrifice. The second implication is the resurrection of Jesus secures the eternal covenant. It secures the eternal covenant. Jesus offered the cup to his disciples saying, this is my blood of the covenant. The book of Hebrews is constantly comparing the new covenant of God's grace through faith in Jesus to the old covenant of God's law brought through Moses. The old covenant was temporary. The old covenant was powerless to save. Not because of any flaw on God's part or because the law is bad, but because of our own sin, the effects of our sin, and our inability to to keep God's law. The Old Testament law, then, is like a mirror. The law can show you what you look like, but it can't change what you look like. That's not the mirror's fault. That is what mirrors do. 
The law shows you what God is like. The law shows you your sin. The law shows you your need for a Savior. The law provided animal sacrifices, but we see that that was only a stopgap. The author of Hebrews has already said in chapter 10, verse 4, that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. The law can show you your sin, but it can't change your heart and ultimately can't atone for you before God. It is insufficient because of our depravity. It's the difference between mowing over the weeds in your yard and uprooting them. For that, a new covenant is needed. The Old Testament talks about this new covenant in places like Jeremiah 31, which when we get to Hebrews 8, is largely quoting Jeremiah 31. There, God promises to write His law on the hearts of His people. Ezekiel 36 tells us how He's going to do that. It says He's going to do it by giving His people His Spirit and giving them a new heart which is set on obeying Him. And it is that new covenant that Jesus inaugurated by dying on the cross. In this covenant, the sins of His people are forgiven. And they are empowered for a life of godliness that culminates not in death, but eternal glorified resurrection life. Blood payment for sin was still required. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, he certainly did that. But unlike animals who were sacrificed every single day and the priests who stood daily at their service, which was proof that the work was not done, Jesus died once for all. What is the proof that he died once for all? He was raised from the dead. So you can trust that the new covenant in his blood is secure because of his resurrection. But what does that mean for us practically? It means, among other things, that every day we have to forsake the idea that we have to work for our own salvation. Forsake the notion that law-keeping will get you anywhere with God. You embrace the provision of Jesus and the new covenant on His terms. You take God at His word that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That He has given you a new nature which is enlivened by the very Spirit of God who dwells in you. Which means you heed Paul's words in Romans 6.11, Reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Why? Because Christ is alive. That is your power for battling sin. That is your hope for life now and life forever with God. His covenant with, Jesus, with you in Jesus is sure. But before we move on, there's one last thing I think it's helpful not to miss about this new covenant. The author of Hebrews says that it is the eternal covenant. I think we can see that it's eternal in at least two senses. It's eternal first moving backwards. Revelation 13.8 talks about having salvation as having your name written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Something that happened before the foundation of the world precedes the giving of the law in the Old Covenant through Moses. The book before the foundation of the world of the Lamb who was slain, the Old Covenant through Moses. Which one comes first? the eternal one. So not only was the old covenant temporary, it seems then it's best to understand it as a shadow that was being cast from heaven by the covenant that was already established in the foreknowledge and predetermined will of God. That's another way of saying that the death and resurrection of Jesus for sins was plan A. That's the point of Hebrews 10.1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So it is eternal moving backwards. But it's also eternal moving forward. This means that we haven't gone from the old covenant of law to the new covenant in Jesus only to await some other revelation from God about how we are to be reconciled to Him and how we are to know Him. In the very first verses of Hebrews, you will see that God had spoken long ago at many times and many ways to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Fully, finally, and definitively, God has revealed Himself in Christ. If Muhammad or Joseph Smith, for example, had been raised from the dead, 
I would be inclined to listen to them. But the new covenant in Jesus is eternal moving forward because He was raised from the dead. The old one is obsolete, and there isn't another one coming. You can't go backwards into law-keeping, and there's nothing and no one else coming to save you next. It is Christ and Christ alone. His resurrection secures the eternal covenant. The third implication is the resurrection of Jesus ensures our obedience. This is really the application of the text. We've already seen that we can't be saved through law-keeping, but it remains that God means for His people to obey Him. This passage makes no sense if it doesn't matter how you live. If it doesn't matter whether or not you obey God, a prayer that you would be equipped to do His will is nonsense. There is no contradiction in saying that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that heartfelt love for and obedience to Christ is the mark of genuine faith. Those are not contradictory statements. Look back at verse 21. The prayer here is that God will fit you with everything good to do His will, which is essentially Ephesians 2.10 in the form of a prayer. The idea there is that Christians are the workmanship of God, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is that as a prayer. Yes, amen, let it be so, Lord. Equip me for every good work of faith that I might do your will. The second half of the phrase, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, is essentially the prayer form of Philippians 2, 12 and 13. You're familiar with that. We're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the prayer form of that. God, to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, I need you to work in me to will and to work for your good pleasure. It's saying that the power to obey God comes from God. It is resurrection power. He gives you the work to do and the power to do it. This is how Paul says it in Ephesians 1, 18 to 20. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Hear this. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The power at work saving and sanctifying you in Christ is the same power God worked in him when he raised him from the dead. We need resurrection power for salvation because by nature we're dead in sin. We need resurrection power for sanctification because even as we confess here every week, our hearts are often cold. We're prone to wander. Left to our own devices, we'd surely fall. I need resurrection power to save me and to keep me. That is the power that God supplies in Christ. But the text here in Hebrews says a little bit more than simply God gives us the power, as if that weren't enough. It is one thing to have the power to do something, and another thing to work with that power and actually do it. God is working in Christians... What is pleasing in his sight? Which in the context of this prayer must include us obeying his will. So the power of God that's at work in Christians, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, not only empowers our obedience, but it guarantees our obedience. It ensures it. I want you to see, even from the Old Testament, talking about the new covenant, that this is not an overstatement. Look at Ezekiel's description of the new covenant in chapter 36, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Obedience isn't optional in the Christian life because it has the power to save you. It's because God's power to save you guarantees your obedience. Salvation remains all of grace and not of works so that we have no grounds for boasting, and yet this grace is infused with power and desire to do the works that we are called to do, so that we work in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. As one pastor has said, God creates what He commands, or you might say, God establishes what He enables. 
If that makes you feel uneasy, because you could say, well, what about sin then? If God guarantees our obedience, if He ensures our obedience through Christ, what do we say to sin? It doesn't mean that we never sin, but it does mean that the resurrecting power of God will lead His children to repentance, because repentance is part of Christian obedience. You can trust that it is God who ensures your obedience to the good things that He has prepared for you to do, and your repentance when you fail to do them. That is a huge part of Christian assurance that even Michael prayed about this morning. The correcting discipline of God is a mark of love, not towards just anyone, but specifically to His children. So then what are the good things that we're being equipped for? What is the will of God that we're being empowered to obey? What is pleasing in God's sight? There are a lot of things that we could say here, but I think there's some things in Hebrews that can specifically direct us. First and most importantly, wherever we, like the recipients of this letter, have any tendency towards retreating from the gospel back into works or anything else, we have to remember there's nothing to go back to. Jesus and Jesus alone can save us. His sacrifice is vindicated. The eternal covenant in His blood is sure. That is just as true for you if you have been a Christian for 60 years or 60 seconds. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead by means of the blood of the eternal covenant is, and it is the only thing that is, sufficient to save and sanctify you. If you're a Christian, I hope that you will find comfort and assurance in that. If not, if you're not a believer, my plea to you is to consider the resurrection of Jesus and the claims of the gospel. Repent of your sins and trust in Christ alone. Stop trying to save yourself by good works and look to Jesus alone for grace. If you are a Christian, then you've got to trust that the source of power for a life of godliness comes not from you but from Him. You can turn back. You may not even have to turn a page in your Bible to the very beginning of Hebrews 13 briefly work our way through this, and I want you just to see some of the things that we are called to do in Christ. And my question to you is to ask whether or not you have the strength on your own to do these things. Verse 1, continue in brotherly love. Verse 2, show hospitality. Verse 3, remember Christians who are mistreated. Verse 4, honor marriage and be faithful in marriage. Verse 5, contentment and not loving money. Verse 7, imitating the godliness and faith of Christian leaders. Verse 9, holding fast to sound doctrine. Verse 13, bearing reproach for Jesus' sake. Verse 15, praising God and acknowledging Jesus before people. Verse 16, doing good and sharing what we have. Verse 17, obeying and submitting to pastoral authority. We could add all manner of things to the list of what we are commanded to do in Scripture out of love for God and for others. The point in our application is not to make just a list of commands that we ought to be obeying, but to see that anything we ever could do in obedience to God for His glory is only possible with the power and good pleasure of God at work in us. But don't miss that all of these things are means to another end. The end is not actually Christian obedience. If you look back at verse 21. The heart of the request is that God would work in us that which is good as He does what is pleasing in His sight. But don't miss the doxology. The end of these things is the glory of God. This is a request for God by means of working in us to obey Him to be glorified forever. The only reason that makes sense is that if it's God's power enabling and ensuring our obedience. We get the grace. God gets the glory.